say thanks for the things you have done for me things so undeserved yet you give to prove your love for me the voices of a million angels could not express my gratitude all that i am and ever hope to be i owe it all to thee to God be the glory, to God be the glory, to God be the glory for the things he has done with his blood he has saved me with his power he has raised me to God be the glory for the things he has done just let me live my life. Let it be pleasing, O oh Lord, to Thee. And should I gain any praise, let it go to Calvary with His blood. saved me with his power he has raised me to God be the glory for the things he for the things for the things I lost it. Wonderful. Wow. I've been waiting all week to hear him sing. So many of you have told me how good he was, and he is. And thank you, Richard, and thank you, James. It's been a blessing. I have enjoyed the music this week. If you were to travel with me week after week, church after church, and listen to some of the singing I have to listen to, <laughs> You would be a serial killer, I promise you. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I have certainly enjoyed being with you, and thank you, Pastor, for inviting me. I, I'm here at your invitation, and it's just been a joy. Your pastor and his wife, your first lady, have been such wonderful hosts to me this week. We've had a, a good time just fellowshipping with each other. I had not met your pastor till I arrived here on uh, Sunday morning. We talked on the phone, but I'd never met him. But it has been a real delight to be with, uh, with him and his family and uh, to be with you. And I hope maybe one day we can do this again. Now you say, Brother Bob, now you're an evangelist. You say that everywhere you go. I promise you I do not. I do not. Some churches, my favorite view of them is in the rearview mirror as I drive away for the last time. But anyway, it has been a real delight to be here with you, and I thank God for you. Well, take your Bible and turn to the book of Colossians in the New Testament, chapter 2. I didn't really come here tonight 
to preach this message, but the Lord used the song that Brother Richard sang. I don't remember exactly what the phrase was, but he just brought this to my mind, and the Lord confirmed it in my heart, so I want to share this with you tonight. Colossians chapter 2, and we're going to begin reading in verse 13. If you have found it, say amen. amen. What a wonderful crowd we have tonight, by the way. Thank you so much for being here. Colossians 2, verse 13, and you, not him, not her, and you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Back in the 60s and the early 70s, at Christmas time and at Easter time, most church choirs presented a cantata. Now, a lot of churches today, especially the bigger churches, they have great pageants. And, and I'm certainly not opposed to pageants. I love them. They're, they're wonderful presentations of the story of the Lord Jesus. But, but sometimes they bring in uh, uh, donkeys and sheep and camels and the whole auditorium becomes sort of a menagerie. But back in the 60s and early 70s, churches didn't do that. At Easter time and at Christmas time, they simply had a cantata that the adult choir would sing, usually just one night, maybe the, Christ, the Sunday night before Christmas or the Sunday night before Easter. Most of those cantatas back in the 60s and 70s were written by a man named John W. Peterson. John W. Peterson was a great songwriter, and you sing from time to time hymns that he wrote. For example, he wrote that song, Heaven Came Down and Glory Filled My Soul. That was a John W. Peterson song. But of all the songs that John W. Peterson ever wrote, and there were hundreds and hundreds of them, my favorite song of John W. Peterson, it was never in a cantata, it was never on the charts, and I haven't heard anybody sing it, I guess, in 30 years. But it started out with words like this, Why should I sing of lesser things and things that pass away when I have a friend like Jesus now to sing about each day? Isn't that good? The title of that little song was simply My Song. That's what Peterson called it, My Song. Why should I sing of lesser things and things that pass away when I have a friend like Jesus now to sing about each day? Why should we sing of lesser things? Why should I preach of lesser things? Why should we talk of lesser things when we have a friend like Jesus now to sing about and preach about and talk about each day? The Christian life is a love affair with Jesus Christ. Christianity is not a religion. Buddhism is a religion. Hinduism is a religion. Islam is a religion. Taoism is a religion. But Christianity is a love relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That's what Christianity is. Is. It's not me trying to be like Jesus. It's Jesus living his life in and through me. That's a relationship. That's what Christianity is all about. In these three verses that I've read for you, we find a testimony of the Apostle Paul. You say, now, Brother Bob, it doesn't look like a testimony, and you're right, it doesn't. Because usually in the epistles that Paul wrote, when he gives a testimony, and he gives several of them, it's pretty obvious that's what he's doing. But this is one of those subtle testimonies from the Apostle Paul, and basically what he's doing is simply this, I want to tell you why I love the Lord Jesus. And he gives us three reasons in these three verses. And so I want us to look at these, and then we'll have our prayer and our final invitation for this revival meeting. 
First of all, Paul says, I love the Lord Jesus because he met my greatest need. I love the Lord Jesus because he met my greatest need. Now look there in verse 13. And you being dead. Now he's writing to Christians in the city of Colossae and he's reminding them of what they used to be. You know, every once in a while I'll encounter someone and they'll say, well, you know, I've been a Christian all my life. No, you haven't. Nobody's been a Christian all their life. Because there was a time when you were dead, spiritually dead. And so Paul says, and you having been dead, he's referring to what they used to be. Now, if you're not a Christian, you're still dead. But Paul gives two reasons why we used to be spiritually dead. He says, first of all, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Sin brings death. Sin brings death. They're those two things are always together in the Bible. Everywhere sin goes, death marches right beside it. They've never had a dispute. They've never had a falling out. They've never had a fuss. They've never had a disagreement. They've never had a divorce. Sin and death always go together hand in hand. And so Paul says we were dead because of our sin. Sin brings death. But then he gives a second reason. He says not only were you dead in your sins, he says you were dead because of the uncircumcision of your flesh. Now what does that mean? In the day of the New Testament, many Christians were converted Jews. And in the day of the New Testament, many Christians were converted Jews. Gentiles. Now, some of the churches in the New Testament were pretty equally balanced. They had Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. There were some churches, like in Jerusalem, most of the Christians were Jewish Christians. But in other areas, like Colossae, most of the members of the church were Gentiles who had been converted to faith in Jesus Christ. They're, they were not Jews who had been saved. They were Gentiles. And so Paul is reminding them that before they became Christians, they had been uncircumcised in their flesh. Now, now circumcision in the Old Testament was a symbol, a sign of a relationship between a man and God. That's what it was. Circumcision was simply a symbol, an outward sign of a man's relationship to God. And Jews practiced that. But Gentiles did not practice that, at least not for religious reasons. There was nothing symbolic about it for them. And so what Paul is reminding these Colossian Christians of is simply this. Not only did you used to be spiritually dead because of your personal sin, but you were also dead because of the uncircumcision of your flesh. You were outside of any covenant relationship God ever made with man. God made a covenant with Abraham. God made a covenant with Moses. God made a covenant with David. But those were all covenants to the Jewish people. And those of us who were not Jews, we were outside of those covenants. We didn't have any claim to them. We didn't have any right to them. We did not, they were not for us. We were outsiders. We were aliens to the covenants and the promises of God. And so Paul says to these, these Gentile Christians in the church at Colossae, there was a time when you were dead, spiritually you were dead. Now maybe you could see the light and hear the noise and, and handle things with your hands and walk with your feet and legs, but spiritually you were dead to the things of God because you were not part of any covenant that he had ever made with man and because of your own personal individual sin. Now I want to ask you this. What is the greatest need of a dead person? A dead person does not need a course in music appreciation. A dead person does not need a course on the art masters of history. A dead person needs life. And the only giver of life is Jesus Christ, 
himself. A spiritually dead person cannot find life anywhere other than Jesus Christ. Jesus is the life. He gives life. He sustains life. He's the sovereign master of life. Jesus is the life. And that's what Paul says. He says there in verse 13, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he, hath Jesus quickened, and that word quickened means made alive. Jesus made you alive together with him, and here's how he did it. Having forgiven you all your trespasses. How did you become a child of God? The Bible teaches that when you got saved, you passed from death into life. Amen. You were spiritually dead, but when you got saved, you became spiritually alive. You were dead to the things of God, now you were alive to the things of God. When you were spiritually dead, the Bible didn't mean anything to you. But when you became spiritually alive, the Bible became everything to you. When you were spiritually dead, you didn't want to hear preaching, but when you became spiritually alive, now you love to hear the word of God proclaimed. When you were spiritually dead, you didn't care anything about singing the songs we've been singing this week, but when you became spiritually alive, you loved to sing the songs of the faith. Something happened to you. Now, how did that happen? Well, God did not wave a magic wand over your head. God did not sprinkle pixie dust on your head. God saved you. God allowed you to pass from death to life by the speaking of a word. And that word is found right here at the end of verse 13. It is the word forgiven having forgiven you. When the Holy Spirit of God convicted you of your sin and you realized that you were lost and on your way to hell and you came in repentance of sin and you put your faith in Jesus Christ as the Savior and the Lord of your life, when you trusted him, he spoke forgiveness into your life. And that's when you got saved. You didn't get saved when you got baptized. You didn't get saved when you took the Lord's Supper. You didn't get saved when you walked down the aisle and filled out a card. You got saved when Jesus spoke forgiveness into your life. The word forgive, forgiven forgiveness, is one of the most beautiful words in all the Bible. It literally means to send away. It means to take something that is here and send it somewhere else. There are three pictures of that in the Bible. In one place, the Bible says, God has taken our sins and has put them in the middle of his back. Have you ever tried to see something in the middle of your back? Even an Indian rubber man can't turn his head that far. You can't do it. You cannot see something in the middle of your back. Another place the Bible says God has taken our sins and has cast them into the depths of the deepest sea. Now, I don't know how deep the deepest sea is. I'm sure oceanographers know how deep the deepest sea is, and I'm sure God knows how deep it is, but it really doesn't matter. It's just a picture. But the Bible says he's taken our sins and has cast them into the depths of the deepest sea. The picture there is he's put them in a place he no longer sees them. A third place the Bible says God has taken our sins and has removed them from us as far as the east is from the west. Now I want to ask you, how far is the east from the west? There's no way to measure that. It is an immeasurable distance. Now if he had said as far as the north from the south, you could measure that. You go out of this building with a compass and you start heading north. It'll take you a while to get there, but you just keep heading north and eventually you'll come to the North Pole. And once you pass the North Pole, you're headed south and you just keep going and you keep following that compass and you'll eventually come to the South Pole. And when you pass it, you're heading north. You can measure the distance from north 
to south, but not east to west. Tomorrow morning, I'll go over to uh, Greenville uh, Airport and I'll get on an airplane. You can go any day of the week and get on an airplane and start heading east and you can circle planet Earth 25 times and all you're doing is heading east. Or you can get on a plane and head west and you can circle the planet 25 times and all you're doing is heading west. There's no way to measure east from west. And so God said, I have removed your sins as far as the east is from the west. So which is it, Brother Bob? Has God taken my sins and put them in the middle of his back? Or has God taken my sins and put them in the depths of the deepest sea? Or has God taken my sins and removed them as far as the east is from the west? Which is it? Yes, pick one, doesn't make any difference. They're all just pictures that when Jesus forgave you, he sent your sin away. A little chorus we used to sing when I was growing up said, you ask me why I'm happy, I'll tell you why. Because my sins are gone. Our sins are gone. We were dead. And Jesus made us alive by forgiving us all our sins. Paul says, you want to know why I love Jesus? I love him because he met my greatest need. Secondly, he says, I love him because he paid my greatest debt. Look there in verse 14. He says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. Now, what does that mean? I'm not a betting man, but if I were, I would be willing to bet all I have. There's not a person in this room tonight that not today nor any time this week have you used that little expression, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. There's not, not a person here that's used that in a sentence this week. We don't talk like that anymore. But what does it mean, the blotting out of the handwriting of ordinances? If a man in the day of the New Testament, if a man had been accused of a crime, he would be arrested, and all of the crimes that he had been accused of committing would be written on a piece of parchment. His name would be at the top, and then they would list one, two, three, four, five, however many there were, all of the crimes he had been accused of committing. That piece of parchment with his name on it and those crimes underneath his name that was referred to as a handwriting of ordinance. And when the day of his court case came, he would go before the judge. The judge would come into the courtroom. He would sit down on the judgment seat. And the bailiff would give to the judge this handwriting of ordinance that had this man's name and the crimes he was accused of committing written down. And the judge would look at it and he would say, sir, is this your name? Yes, your honor, that's my name. Are these the crimes you were accused of committing and arrested for? Yes, your honor, that's what they say that I've done. Now, if that man were found guilty of those crimes, the judge would then sentence him to a term in prison. The length of the prison sentence would be determined by how serious the crimes were. He might be sentenced to a year. He might be sentenced to five years. He might be sentenced to 10 years or 20. When the judge sentenced that man, he would go to the bottom of that parchment and he would write his name, I, judge so-and-so, sentenced this man to X number of years in prison and he would sign it and dated. Then he would roll that scroll, roll that parchment up, and he would give it to the jailer, and the jailer would take that man who had been convicted of those crimes down into the prison block. And he would put him in prison and lock the door, and then he would take that handwriting of ordinance, that piece of parchment, and he would tack it up above the door of the prison cell. 
Now, if you go into prisons today or if you go into jails today, maybe you have a jail ministry here and, and you go and share the gospel to those in jail or maybe you have a loved one in jail and you go see them from time to time. But when you go into a jail today or a prison, you might see a person behind bars, but you don't know who they are. You don't know what their name is and you don't know what crime they have committed. You don't know if they're murderers or thieves or rapists or child molesters or thugs or what. You don't have any idea because there's nothing there to tell. But it wasn't like that in the day of the New Testament. In the day of the New Testament, you didn't have to ask who is that and what did he do. All you had to do was look up above the door. There's his name. There's the crimes he was he had been convicted of committing. And there was the sentence and the signature of the judge who said that was the handwriting of ordinances. Finally, the man would serve his full debt to society. Maybe a year, maybe five, maybe ten. But the day would come, this was his last day in prison. And so the jailer would come, he would unlock the prison door, and he would reach up above that door and take down that handwriting of ordinances, and they would go back before the judge. Now, it might be that same judge, or that judge may have died or retired. It might be another judge. But the man would be brought before the judge and, and the jailer would give that handwriting of ordinances to that judge. And the judge would unroll it and he would say, Sir, is this your name? Yes, Your Honor. And are these the crimes you were convicted of? Yes, Your Honor. And this was the sentence that you were given by Judge so-and-so? Yes, Your Honor. Well, have you served the full sentence? And the man would say, Your Honor... I have served every filthy, lousy, stinking day. I've been in that prison wallowing around in my own body filth with roaches and maggot worms and rats and, uh, and all the filth. I have been in that, I have served every day of that sentence. I have paid my debt in full. And the judge would ask the jailers, this man telling the truth, yes, Your Honor, he has paid his debt in full. And the judge would take that handwriting of ordinances and he would turn it sideways and from top to bottom in great big block letters he would write one word. It was the word tetelestai. It means the debt has been fully paid. The judge would give that man that handwriting of ordinance. And he would go home. Maybe he hadn't been home in 20 years or 10 or 5 or 1. And when he got home, he would take that handwriting of ordinance and he would tack it on the front door of his house. Maybe the next day he would be out in the yard doing yard work and somebody came by and said, Man, I thought you were in prison. What would you do? Did you break out? Did you escape? And all he had to do would be to point to that handwriting of ordinances on the door of his house. Now you might not be able from a great distance, you might not be able to see his name, you might not be able to see the crimes that he'd been convicted of, but even from a long way off, you could see that one great big block word from bottom to top, to tell us the debt is fully paid. When Jesus was hanging upon the cross, he spoke seven times. I'm sure your pastor has through the years preached on the seven last words of Christ. One of the times that Jesus spoke as he was hanging on the cross, he said that word, tetelestai. It comes into our Bibles translated like this. It is finished. It is finished. The debt has been fully paid. Beloved, I want to tell you, Jesus Christ paid our greatest debt. The book of Hebrews says it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away our sin. But this man, this man Jesus, by his one offering on the cross, paid our sin debt in full. Paul said, you want to know why I love Jesus? I love him because he met my greatest need and he paid my greatest debt. And then thirdly, he said, I love Jesus because he defeated my greatest enemy. 
Look there with me, if you will, in verse 15. And having small principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. He spoiled principalities and powers. Now, what are principalities and powers? In Ephesians 6, Paul said, We don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. He's talking about ranks or orders of demonic spirits, and over them the devil rules that kingdom of darkness. And so he's talking about demons and the devil. And the Bible says Jesus spoiled them. Now that's interesting. Now, you understand that words change in their meaning. Now, I know what it means to spoil somebody today. I am a grandfather of seven grandchildren, and I tell you I love them. This past weekend, I was in Las Vegas, Nevada, at the wedding of my oldest granddaughter, and I flew from there to here this past Saturday. I love my grand. One lady said, have I shown you the pictures of my grandchildren? I said, no, ma'am, and I sure do appreciate it. <laughs> I have four grandchildren in Las Vegas. I call them Skillet, Scooter, Skeeter, and Scamper. I have three grandchildren in Alabama. I call them Bear, Biscuit, and Bubbles. I thank God for my grandchildren. I love them, and it is the God-given right and responsibility of a grandfather to spoil his grandchildren. Now, if you're a young adult with young children, I want you to listen to this right now and don't ever forget it. If it is five minutes before supper time, I mean if it's five minutes before supper time and Papa or Granddaddy or Big Daddy comes by the house and wants to carry his grandchildren to the candy store or the ice cream store five minutes before supper time, it is absolutely all right. <laughs> you just don't say a word and say, go ahead with your grandfather. They won't remember your green bean casserole. <laughs> but they'll remember Big Daddy carrying them to the ice cream store. And those of us who are grandparents, we have to make memories, and we have to make them fast, because when you get to be a grandparent, you don't have a lot of time left to do it. So that's what the word spoil means today. I spoil my grandchildren. But that's not what the word meant in the day of the Bible. The word spoil means, it means to, uh, to defeat, to dishonor, to disgrace. But literally, it means to defang. That's what it means. Defang. It is a picture of a wild, ferocious animal and somebody has knocked his teeth out and all he can do is gum you. <laughs> the Bible says Jesus Christ defamed. He knocked the teeth out of all the demonic spirits everywhere. I stay in motels all the time. I told you that. And I, I, I'm there about at least 180 to 200 nights a year in motel rooms. And, and uh, somebody said, Brother Bob, what if you were in a motel room and, uh, and about 3 o'clock in the morning demons came in the room and the bed began to go up and down and the chairs began to float back and forth and the mirrors on the wall began to spin? What would you do? I said, well, if the devil wants to put on a show for me, I'll watch it. But I'm not going to be afraid of it. I'm not going to be afraid of anyone when the worst he can do is gum me because Jesus has already knocked his teeth out. When did it happen? I'll tell you, it took place at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He triumphed openly 
over them, the Bible says. When Jesus Christ came out of the grave, he literally conquered sin, death, hell, and the grave. He's alive, he's alive, and because he's alive, because he defeated all of the demonic powers, he defeated my greatest enemy. Paul said, you want to know why I love Jesus? I love him because he met my greatest need. I was dead and he gave me life. I love him because he paid my greatest debt. I was a doomed and damned sinner on my way to hell and Jesus paid the price so that I might be redeemed by the shedding of his blood. And Paul says, I love him because he defeated my greatest enemy. There was a day when the devil had a chain around my neck and when he pulled, I jumped because I was his. But Jesus came and he broke that chain and set the prisoner free and now I belong to him and thank God for that. Jesus met my greatest need. He paid my greatest debt. He defeated my greatest enemy. Why should I sing of lesser things and things that pass away when I have a friend like Jesus now to sing about each day. Would you stand with me? Lord, tonight we've just come to, to brag about Jesus. We've sung songs that honored him and I've shared a passage of scripture that is a tribute to him. Lord Jesus, thank you for doing for us what our mother could not do or our dad. Thank you for doing for us what government could not do. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for meeting our greatest need and paying our greatest debt and defeating our greatest enemy. Lord, no wonder the hymn writer said, Hallelujah, what a Savior. And Lord, if there's anybody here tonight, man, woman, young person, boy or girl, anybody, that does not know him personally as Savior and Lord, I pray that tonight they would come and give their life to him. In Jesus' name, amen. In a moment, we're going to sing our hymn of invitation. And if you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, I encourage you to come. Sometimes people get a little timid about stepping out before a congregation and coming forward. I promise you it doesn't hurt. Most of us here have already done that. It didn't hurt a bit, did it? It doesn't hurt. Just come to Jesus. Just come and give him your heart. Just come. That's all you have to do is just come. He's already done the work. Just come. Trust him. Believe in him. Commit your life to him. He will save you. He doesn't care who you are or where you live or what language you speak or what sins you've ever done. He will save you. He will save you. And then maybe there's some here, and we've had several at the altar this week making some really meaningful decisions. I think I have read every book written about revival that has been printed in the last 200 years. I think. Now, there may be a new one that's come off the press in, a, in the last couple of three months, but I believe I've read every book written about revival that's been printed in the last 200 years. I think I know what revival is. Revival is a time in the life of a child of God when they fall in love with Jesus all over. Jesus said to the church at Ephesus, he said, I have something against you because you've left your first love. You know what that means? Jesus was saying to that church, he said, you don't love me like you used to. I was a pastor for 33 years. From time to time, folks would come in my office. Sometimes it would be a man he would say, Brother Bob, my wife doesn't love me like she used to. Sometimes it would be a lady. and She would say, Brother Bob, my husband, he doesn't love me like he used to. Sometimes it would be a parents, and they would say, Brother Bob, our children don't love us like they used to. And that always made me sad, it did. 
But how much sadder it must surely be if Jesus says to his church, you don't love me like you used to. Sometimes I think it's important for God's people just to express to God openly their love for him afresh. You know, sometimes when we're really, really sick and it looks like we may not make it, we'll, we'll come to the altar and ask God for healing, and that's perfectly fine. Sometimes when we've gotten out into some sin that we shouldn't have gotten into, we'll come to the altar and ask God for forgiveness, and that's perfectly fine. But sometimes it's just good to make our way to the altar of God. Just say, Lord Jesus, I didn't come to ask you for anything wanted to tell you afresh I love you that's what revival is and so as we come to this last invitation we're not coming back tomorrow night and run at it again this is it this is it and if you still have not yet experienced that warm spring of revival this week in your life I pray you'll come and if you've never been saved pray that you'll come and give your heart to Jesus Christ. Brother Richard, come and lead us as we sing and as we sing this old familiar hymn, I want you just to, you don't need a book or anything, you know it by heart. If you don't know it, just hum. But, but I want to encourage you to come as God has spoken to your heart as we sing. You come on right now. Come on. Amen. We were talking last night the saddest thing, the saddest thing is to, for a pastor, to watch someone breathe their last breath and go off into eternity unsaved. There's never been a horror film made that horrible. That's the saddest thing that I know there is. You know what I believe the second saddest thing is? Is for a saved person to live an unsaved life. That's sad. And praise God for this, this, this revival. And that's exactly what it was, a revival message. Reminding us, sometimes we forget whose we are. And we're living like prisoners or slaves when we've been set free. I like Bob George. He wrote, he wrote a book a long time ago, uh, Classic Christianity. And he writes about how, how lost people are, are, are like worms, are like caterpillars crawling around, and saved people are like butterflies. And they don't have to crawl around like worms, but they do. Sometimes they can fly. And that's a sad thing. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you're not living for the Lord Jesus, you're a miserable person. And you, the good news is you don't have to be that way. You're a prisoner of your own doing because Jesus paid the price. Wow, what a beautiful expression of it we saw tonight, heard tonight, Brother Bob. Praise the Lord for your ministry, Dr. Pittman. Amen. 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 You know what? We've said it over and over and over again. The only hope for our nation is the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, and Christians to begin living like Christians. You know what Christian men need? Christian men need to live like Christian men. <laughs> and Christian women need to begin living like Christian women. That's revival. And you can, you know, place your hope in Christ, in Jesus Christ. What a week. It's been a great, great week being revived and reminded of the, of the joy of and the value of our salvation through the, uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. What a 
awesome time of worship. And uh, I'm so glad many of you have been here every service, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, tonight. And uh, if you missed a service, you can go on our website and watch it. And uh, praise God. Praise God for this week. Praise God for men uh, like Dr. Pittman who just go around. You know, I've been with him this week. I've had a ball with him. I have had a blast. I was telling him earlier. We just had so much fun. And um, uh, I was telling Tina last night. We got back here. I dropped him off at his uh, uh, his car at about 10 o'clock. And I looked over at Tina and I said, I do not understand how that man does that. Because I was wore out. And I was exhausted. And uh, week after week, I pray for, pray for Dr. Pittman. And and others to travel and share the good news uh, and, 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 and help churches and help Christians to remember whose they are and who they are. We're free. We need to live like it. Amen? Amen. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for your attendance, uh, your faithful attention. Um, thank you for being you. If you're a guest, uh, Northgate Baptist Church is just, uh, and I'm not saying this because I'm the pastor. I'm, I'm just telling you the truth. It is an awesome, awesome church. It is. It really is. Those are all new members that said that. I know they understand. Uh, and here's why. Here's why. And I'll just tell you quickly. Then, uh, then uh, I'll, um, I will, um, we'll close. Is because Northgate Baptist Church is real. That's it. In one word, real. That's the word. Well, Jesus, that's right. His name is Jesus. <laughs> All right. Richard, will you close us with a word of prayer? Father, we thank you for how you have taken us through your word this week taught us so much. Father, most of all, we thank you for the reminder tonight that we're free, that you've set us free, and that this life is about you living through us. It's not about us. Father, we just praise you for that. Father, we pray that this revival will not end but it's just begun. And that you'll work in the hearts and lives of each of us. And that we will go from this place and continue to be the church in a mightier way because we allow you to live in and through us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.